This is the Turtle Dojo, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles podcast with your hosts, Adam and Chris. Welcome to another episode of the Turtle Dojo, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles podcast. As always, I'm your host, Adam, and with me is my co-host, Chris. Chris, how's it going? Doing great, as usual, Adam. Good to see you again, my friend. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. It's always good to see you and talk uh, about our favorite uh, heroes in a half shell. Uh, yeah. And uh, before we get going, um, I will say a belated happy birthday to you, sir. Uh, it was your birthday uh, before we recorded. Uh, so I want to wish you uh, a, 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 well, I know because I know we've talked, that you had a happy birthday, you had a good birthday. Uh, and, you know, I have to ask you because we're on, you know, geek related podcasting and, and things of that nature. So, any geek related gifts uh, come your way geek related birthday gifts yes yeah actually funny you bring that up hold on one second um my uh, (laughs) my kids uh who are awesome got me uh the art of the batman book Uh, yes a very good book very good book that accompanied an excellent movie uh and we can talk about batman and ninja turtles podcast because for two reasons a it's our show we'll do what we want and B, right on there was a crossover between the sure. two one uh, once upon a time so that makes it fair game <laughs> um that's awesome that's a, that's a great gift and uh, yeah let me know what they you did about. well for me yeah there you go so they, they've learned they, they've learned the, uh, the the way to uh the proper uh, gift gift purchasing uh, uh, methods and things to purchase. That, that's good. You're, you're teaching them well. Is the is the uh, is the uh, message behind that gift? Uh, yep. It's 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 a testament to your parenting. Is what that is. Um, but uh, all right, with with that uh, put aside um, for at least another year until next year's birthday. <laughs> um, let's uh, let's talk some turtles. Um, so let's do it. There's, uh, of course, the main the main focus of our show tonight will be uh, a review of all the, the the whole story of the the last Ronin. We were doing it in parts, but that thing the the schedule the release schedule of that that story got so disjointed and and ridiculous that uh, Chris and I kind of forgot wh- where we left off, what the story was. So so we made the decision to you know just wait it out, wait till the end and then review the story as a whole. So that's the main focus of, of what we're going to do. Uh, but it's worth uh, mentioning in the comic realm a bit of news. Now, Chris, you'll recall, whether you watched it or not, I'm not sure, but, but you'll recall that in 1997, I believe, Fox Kids had a live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles TV show, right? Uh, produced uh, by Saban Entertainment, which, at the same time, was the keepers of the Power Rangers and producers of the Power Rangers franchise. Uh, Just so printing they, money over there at Saban Entertainment. Just they were in, back in the, in the day. late nineties, and now Hasbro said, "Yeah, we'll take some of that Power Ranger money. Thank you." And they've taken over the brand, which I'm happy about because I'm a fan. It's funny how I'm a fan of the. The things that I'm a fan of, aside from Batman and Superman, are, are teams of four or five, you know, uh, individuals who run around, who are superheroes and run around in color-coded uh, costume accessories and, and and employ martial arts as their as their main uh, form of of butt kicking. So it's just it, it is what it is. But anyway, uh, so so Ban was in charge. It was on Fox Kids. It was a live action show. Look, the quality of it wasn't that great. Uh, it's uh, I'll call I'll call it what it was. Uh, it wasn't like the, the the '90s movies, you know, the first two movies where the where the I mean, they were using um, um, suits like guys in suits, right. but it wasn't of the quality of the Jim Henson uh, company. I mean, I mean, very rarely can you can you achieve that quality uh, if you're not the Jim Henson studio. So. Uh, but it wasn't of that quality. Uh, but the interesting thing that that show did was they were the first 
iteration of the franchise to introduce a female uh, turtle uh, who yep. went by the name of Venus de Milo. And of course, the IDW comics introduced their own uh, uh, a female turtle uh, whose name is Jenica. Uh, but in the most recent story, um, as of last issue, uh, they introduced uh, Venus de Milo into the comics. Um, and that was an issue 127, uh, was her first appearance. Uh, it's very different um, than what she was on the show. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of a, like, there's a horror element to her origin hmm. story. And it's very... I'm going to say this and it's going to sound weird because we're coming off of reading The Last Ronin, which was a pretty dark story. But what they're doing in this current ongoing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, specifically with this introduction of Venus, is really dark. It's kind of like there's a bit of Saw quality happening there. Uh, I, and I'm being vague because eventually we're going to get to reading the current IDW comics, so I don't want to spoil anything for you. Okay. But, but it's I was shocked at how a how different it was from from the show, and b how 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 dark and somewhat disturbing her origin story is. So interesting. Uh, I'm very interested to see where um, where this goes. Uh, and if she is going to be, you know, just for this storyline, or if she's going to continue forward uh, in the continuity. Um, but speaking of, first of all, what do you think of uh, Chris? Then going that sort of a deep cut and introducing, you know, that character. I mean, I think it's awesome. It adds, uh, you know, it. I have a daughter, and my son. Uh, likes to watch Ninja Turtles movies and uh, he'll probably enjoy reading Ninja Turtles comics in another couple of years. Mm. And this is a way for my, this is an end for girls to um, be introduced to the property who might not otherwise be. So maybe she can watch the, you know, the, they don't watch the old TV show. Um, but if they were watching that show now, I think that would be a good way for her to get in and, and probably, a, you know, an interesting way to bring girls into the comics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, look the fact that they went that far, uh, you know, to to a, to an iteration of the po of the property that let's be honest didn't let, light any fires, uh, you know, and and, and then <coughs> obviously it only lasted one season. So how how successful was it? It did give me an episode where the Power Rangers and Turtles crossed over, which which I to this day find hilariously fascinating. That's awesome. Uh, but they did it in the comics, so, and and that, I mean, we haven't covered that comic, did we? Mm, I'm no. really not a Power Rangers guy, but I think we have to cover that comic. Sure. And and I think you'll like it because it's done very well. Like, quick aside, the way the comics do the Power Rangers, it's all like I mean, they still have you know, it's the core, the the basic concept is the same. Right. But it's kind of like it reminds me of where 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 the tone of the show was essentially a live action Saturday morning cartoon, right? The Power Rangers comics that Hasbro and Boom Studios are putting out are essentially the tone of the Arrowverse, kind of. Right. Little a little bit more yeah. uh, a higher age bracket. Kind of like Flash. Arrow, Flash, you know, that kind of vibe. Yeah. Uh, uh, there. So, but when they teamed the tour, it was a very good crossover. So we'll have to, we'll have to, uh, and, and it, and it brought about some awesome toys. I'll just say that. So we'll, we'll cover those eventually as well. Um, uh, but it, we got that crossover first in live action. So, you know, uh, everybody talks about Marvel and the MCU. Uh, there are a lot of other properties that did it first. Not that, they, not that I hate Marvel because I love Marvel, but it is, I'm just pointing out the obvious. Um, so, in addition to Venus de Milo, uh, this summer, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles ongoing comic 
is having a big event that is called uh, the Armageddon game. And it features and it features a villain um, known as, and I don't know if he's a villain from the original Mirage comics, but uh, or or the cartoons. My memory is literally today. I can't I can't remember like I can't remember this character aside from the IDW comics. The main villain is the Rat King. I don't know if okay. you if you've heard of him before. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so he's not he's not new. He's he's established. Okay, my mind, yeah, like I said, I, I, look, my hockey team is in the midst of a playoff series. I can't think of much of anything besides that. So bear with me, folks. Hey, uh, during and, the during the Braves playoff run last year, you couldn't tell me anything, dude. I wasn't hearing it. So you know, you know, absorbed. you know, you know what I'm going through. Uh, yep. Except your team won the championship. My team is still in the first round. I'm just going to leave it there because I'm not going to make no predictions because I don't do that anymore. I've been burned too many times. Anyway, uh, so the Rat King is the main villain, and he's orchestrating a bunch of other villains to come after the Turtles. And cool. it's, so it's a big deal, a lot of promotion going into this event. Uh, so I'm stoked about, about, about getting into it. And uh, I, I thought it would have been, it was, it, it, since we're covering a big deal in the Turtles comic space, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of get everybody apprised of what's going on um, in the current ongoing title. So if you want to learn about Venus uh, de Milo, pick up her book, pick up the book now uh, that's currently out. And if you're excited for that summer crossover or, or that summer event, not really a crossover, um, but uh, check that out um, because uh, it's looking like IDW thinks it's going to be a big deal. So, um, so, so check that out if you're a reader of the comics. We'll, like I said, Chris and I will eventually be covering the IDW comics, and we are going to do the arduous thing about going back to number one. So, uh, and, and, but I've loved this run of the comics, and I think you will too, because they do, it's a lot more, it's a good, it's a, what I'll say about the IDW comics, is there a good blend of the Mirage stories and the animated series? Like they, they, they found a good balance. And so I really like the comics, those versions of the comics, I think you will too. Cool. But, uh, but that's all we have for news. So we're gonna take a quick break. And on the other side of the break, we're gonna review The Last Ronin, the complete story. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. I'm your host, Adam. And I'm the Emerald Enthusiast. And for all your multiverse viewing and listening needs, check out our shows. That includes Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Ghostbusters, Masters of the Universe, the Marvel Universe, and the DC Comics Universe, including the Emerald Echo Podcast. All right here on YouTube and Podbean. From the first podcast and vidcast to the last. And we're back. So, Donnie does that so much better than I do, but, you know, he's not here. So, uh, unless I get him to record an insert where he does that, uh, that's a little too much work. He does enough work with the editing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not torture the guy. Um, but, um, so, Chris, finally, after, I think it was, I want to say, the duration of this five-issue story ended up being about a full year. I think we did the first issue of it in like June of last year, so this so would yeah, be not, a, this would be eleven months, I think. Yeah, yeah. Originally, it was supposed to come out <laughs> every two months. We we're supposed to get an issue. Yeah, they didn't quite make that. Which would have been, which would have been what? Yeah. So I mean, it would have been a lot. Uh, that that was bad enough when I first heard the release schedule. I was like, oh, damn it, really? Two months in between. Right. And then it ballooned into what it was, and it's like, oh, this, but look. With these, types of, uh, with these types of, like, event stories, though, the publication deadline is, it always takes longer. I mean, we just went through that with Doomsday Clock in D.C. Yeah. Like, I know how these things go. And, and look, it's nobody's fault. There was a pandemic. 
Uh, yeah. It still is a pandemic. Uh, there's a paper shortage. So, I mean, you know, you know stuff happens. Uh, there's a lot there's a lot worse things to be complaining about than comic book today. So, uh, put it all into perspective. There it is. But it's all here now. Yeah. And I'm just going to, right off the bat, spoilers. This book is fantastic. So if you want right. to know my react, if you want a, a reaction and you don't want to hear anything else because you haven't read it yet, if you want to pause right here b- b- before continuing on and read the thing and then come back, it's fantastic. And, and so you, you've got two seconds. If you want to pause and go read it and come back, now's your chance. You're still here? Good. All right. Keep in mind, everything we say from now on, there's going to be spoilers. Oh, so yeah. Don't come at us, yell, and we spoil everything. We gave you a chance to get out. You stayed. You're ready for the spoilers. So, Chris, we open up, and this is a much different New York. Oh, yeah. Than we're used to in the, in the Turtles uh, franchise. Uh, uh, what did you think of the whole, you know, the city's sort of walled off and it's and it's 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 futuristic i mean i can't remember what yeah. year what year was this set in do you uh, i don't think it tells you the exact year um but all we know is that it takes place 16 30. years after an event after after an event took place that ended up leading to the death of three of the four ninja turtles that's right. the only real like time frame that we're given i think okay okay um so like right off the bat oh but you asked what i thought of of the city yeah yeah so it's like we're the new york that we're shown is like you said it's walled off it's a futuristic post-apocalyptic um (laughs) city that is reminiscent of you know things like i don't know maybe like a blade runner blade runner yeah, yeah 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 with but the city is apparently completely run uh, by Oroko Hiroku, who is the son of, or grandson of Shredder. Yes. He's, he's running things in New York City with his uh, foot clan from his tower. He's running the foot with an iron fist. Iron fist. Anyway, yeah. there we go. Uh, I had to do that. Yeah. Um, where, by the way, where's my Daredevil Ninja Turtles crossover? The hand, the foot, I mean, it writes itself. Anyway, right there. I digress. I digress. Um, but so you, you, you've got this new state of affairs in New York. Um, and then you're hit with the, with the, with the, with the, the shock of three of your four favorite heroes in this universe have been killed. Or, yeah, or, or dead by some, uh, by hook or by crook. Well, right? four, four of your favorite five, if you count Splinter. Right, you know? Splinter, Splinter. Can't forget about Splinter. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that in and of itself is is like okay, we're really. Uh, I mean, this isn't this isn't the original cartoon we're dealing with here. This is uh, something very serious very dark and you know they had built it as a, a homage to the tone of the original Mir- mirage uh, studios comics and you know that tracks by the way we start um and so i believe well you're talking about the way the story starts um let me just say this. Today at work, I told a coworker that we were doing this uh, podcast tonight, and mm-hmm. I told him I started talking to him about the last Ronin, and he had never heard of it. Uh, he looked it up on like Apple Books or something on his phone, and just off the like two page preview that they give you for free, he was like, "Oh, dude, this looks so good!" And he like bought the first issue like right there on the spot so he could Love read it. it. Uh, mm-hmm. So this this. Uh, title grabs you from the very beginning from the very first page when you're treated to the this solo lone samurai um turtle who's on a mission um and he's dressed uh, all in black right he's yeah got the hood. He's got the, and he's the got the, and he's got the weapons of of all four of the turtles yeah 
So you can't, just based off his look, you can't tell which of the four brothers this is. Now, And, and based off his uh, mannerisms, you can't tell who it is because this, is a, a, uh, this turtle has been beaten down, has, has had some bad things, has dealt with, with some bad things in life, and now he's out for blood and vengeance, which was never really the case for the original turtles. Yeah, now... Now, this, the, the only mistake they made that gave it away kind of early is if you look at his thought bubbles. Okay. The color of his thought bubbles are the color of his original bandana. So it's like, because everything else they did perfectly. You know, they all. Yeah, got, I didn't catch on to that. All, he had all the all the all the weapons of all four tools, so you don't you wouldn't know. But then they gave it away with the damn. Okay, I'm gonna spoil. It. I told you I was gonna spoil it. The thought bubbles are orange. Yeah, I never noticed that, but now that you mention it, I'm looking back at the pages, and sure enough, it's it's right there in orange. I mean, Crazy. we find out in issue one, so. Yeah, um, and the, the last the last panel, the last um, dialogue box of issue one is April uh, tending to a uh, beaten up Michelangelo, and she says his name, um, and that's how you find out who it is. Now, now some interesting things happen in the sense that he tries to break into you know Hiroto's fortress kind of thing. Yeah, and it doesn't go well, uh, and. Before the issue is over, before he gets to April, uh, he's like, "Well, for the honor of my family, I've got to end this." And the the way we do it in 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 the old ways of uh, of you know feudal Japan and the ninja and the whole nine yards is he goes to pale himself on Leonardo's sword, uh, and he is found. I don't, he Leonardo's get to, broken, he get to do jagged yeah. sword. Yeah, he doesn't get to do it because he passes off from his injuries, right? But he's found by. At this point, she's only referred to as Miss Jones. Now, when I originally read this, I'm like, okay, she's got to be a relative of some sort of Casey Jones. And in futuristic issue, or futuristic in future issues, we indeed find out that she is the daughter of April O'Neil and Casey Jones. Yeah, when we first meet her, you don't know who she is. She just looks like some like she looks uh, like somebody out of Westworld, you know, way some Westworld, kind of steampunk you know, kid. Yeah, some steampunk western kind of yeah yeah hybrid yeah. Um, yeah, but you're, yeah, you're right. She finds uh, she finds Michelangelo in the in the sewers and says, "You're a mutant turtle." So yeah. um, that leads one to believe that she. I mean, that's a random thing for someone to say who doesn't know that a mutant turtle is actually a thing. So it leads yeah. you to believe, like, oh, she's she's shocked to see this, but she knows that this she has a familiarity with this. Mm, yeah, this yeah. Being. Um. <clears throat> So, I, so, so, and then, like you said, you know, he finally, he finally gets reconnected with April. And April is part of the underground, you know, the, the, the poor, the, 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 the downtrodden, the resistance that's trying yeah. to oppose uh, uh, Hiroto, uh, right? And so... Uh, but the imagery, the art, the way they draw April, you could tell she's war torn. She's she's uh, a little jaded. She's uh, you know she's tired. I mean, remember all the descriptions. Well, she's that, missing limbs. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, that, there, there's that. Yeah, but remember those descriptions that we were getting. For Batman and BBS, you can apply them to April, basically. Yeah. Um, she, but but 
she was so badass and the stuff that she was doing as part of the resistance, she had a, a few, you know, a little bit of like a, a, a Sarah Connor vibe to her. Yeah. I, I found. Uh, um, and, you know, through this time, uh, she's been, uh, uh, She's been trying to rebuild um, uh, Professor Honeycutt, right? Right. The, ro the robot. And she has basically a Dark Knight Returns version of the, the turtle van. It's now a tank. Um, it's a it, beast. Absolute yeah. monster. And it look, again, the art in this book. Oh, yeah. Top notch. Is just, it's incredible. Um, <clears throat> there's an added wrinkle um, with uh, in, the, in that we get uh, mental manifestations you know that we see of the other three turtles right because Michelangelo is talking to to talking to them sort of yeah he's talking out loud to them casey and yeah. april even like call him out on it a couple times yeah, they're like you're talking to yourself you know or whatever and so and and it is literally constant bit you know throughout the whole five issues very rarely are they having a good you know a fun i mean they're dead so they, well, how fun can it be but they're not having a fun ch i mean they're bickering as often you know brothers sometimes do um so that's very interesting. Um, but if you're wondering in our review that we're talking about this, they're like, yeah, but what happened to lead us to this place? The good news is you get a lot of that via flashbacks. Sure. Yeah, that's one of the things I really loved about this book is it uh, it goes back and forth between uh, then and now. Um, and the flashback scenes really fill you in. Uh, you're, you know, you're shown what happened to uh the other three turtles and to splinter and how um Hiroto has gone from being uh, a 16 year old who is uh inducted in as the leader of the foot clan to being uh basically the king of new york yeah yeah um what did you think of um because they pretty much showed us how all the others met their end, right? Yeah. Who do you think got the worst of it? Ooh. Um, I think Raphael because he, I drowning is is one thing that scares the hell out of me. It's yeah, one that's way that's horrifying. That, yeah, yeah. It, I don't have like I don't have a fear of getting impaled by a bunch of arrows. Do you know what I'm saying? Like so, yeah, like reading the probability of that is. Pretty low, you know. I mean, hey, if you're gonna go out, I mean, in your last movie, you think that that was pretty awesome, and then you know, <laughs> oh, probably I mean, a pretty, it, probably a pretty hell, badass but, way to yeah, go. Yeah. Um, but it's like you know, you I read stories. There's a lake um, near where I live where people die every summer, and that's so that's like a fear that I have that that's yeah. something that could happen to me. And reading that um, and seeing Raphael even struggling still um with Karai as he was going under the water um that I think that was the one that I would like the least yeah um also interesting about that particular flashback was it had a cool cameo by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird yeah you know they were in a bus right and and Raphael is chasing some foot ninjas on top of the, on top, or was it a train or a bus? Anyway, it, it, it was one of the two. Yeah, Raphael was on top and he was chasing the thing. So it's making a big thud and you know an imprint in the roof. And one of them looks outside the window and was like, "Did you see that? That was a giant." And then they're like, "Ah, no, that's impossible. Never mind." Uh, you know, but you see the way they're drawn; it's clearly them. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, and I also thought just the vibe and the tone of those flashbacks reminded me of Raphael from the movie like it felt like scenes cut from the movie I don't know if you got that vibe as well um uh, yeah other, I can definitely see that 
the other death that was pretty kind of rough was the ambush at the above the antique store. Mm-hmm. Uh, where it exploded, and the I mean, look, you never want to say an explosion looks awesome, but the way it was drawn here, the explosion of that of that antique store looked pretty awesome. The artwork um, was really well done, and. And the antique store mimics the look of the film set. Like it looked yep. like, and I'm and I was sitting there thinking, every time I read this book, I just want to go back and watch that first film again, which is never a bad experience to uh, undertake. But I, I digress. Um, so that was pretty cool, you know, the explosion. That was pretty bad, and you get a lot out of that that explosion. You see how. Honeycutt was destroyed, right? Yep. You see how April ultimately lost her leg, right? And her arm. And her arm had to go to the robotics. Um, you see how or what led to Michelangelo to go missing, um, right? And travel, you know, he did the whole Batman Big Hits thing and traveled the world. Uh, and, and so... Well, uh, he, he went to he, Japan first yeah. to look for... Uh, to look for Splinter, and then yeah. when he found out that Splinter and Donnie were dead, that's when and he even they were ambushed during a retreat. And that was cool too. Yeah, they were ambushed during a, 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 a the under the guise of hey, we're going to sign a peace treaty between the, the you know the the the, the Foot Clan and and Splinter's group. We're going to sign a peace treaty and end this. So they go there. I think it was. The Hamato clan. Yeah, that, thank you. But it was Splinter. Was Donnie there or was it Leo? I can't um, remember. I think it was Donnie. Okay, it was Donnie. And, you know, they're attacked. And they meet there and there. Um, and what that does, though, is it sets up this version of Shredder as really a master manipulator in terms of strategy and, and you know, warfare and, and stuff like that. So I think it gives him a slight edge over his grandfather. Because if you think about Shredder, he often has other people do it in various incarnations. He is the leader of the clan, but... 90% of the time, other people are doing his bidding. And then he pops in for, you know, the boss fight. And then ultimately all, often loses because he's surrounded by, he surrounds himself with idiots. <clears throat> Much like most villains do. So, but this, this version is, like I said, a little bit more tactical, more cunning. And they set that up with that scene, which, which I thought was really cool. Um, in addition to, to the flashbacks we're getting, which <clears throat> has a similar art style, we we got some flashbacks of Michelangelo's travels, but also right. the moments, you know, the, the year, the intervening years <clears throat> April had where she had to sort of rebuild herself. And what's cool about those flashbacks is they're is they're done in a completely different art style. Yeah that mirrors the Mirage comics era, like the early Mirage comics. Yeah, that was really well done. It, it, uh, I, I really dug that art style when it went into those, uh, those flashback scenes. Yeah. Um, it's like, uh, it's that black and white, yeah. uh, with a lot of shading, but yeah, I was, I was really digging that art style for sure. Like and, even Michelangelo and, even looked like the way, Eastman and Laird used to draw them back in, which was cool. Um, so, the, you know, I, I, like you said, I was really, I don't know if I'd want that, if I could, in a, in a modern 2022 scenario, enjoy that for a whole book, like a whole, you know, arc, that art style. But the yeah. way it was used, I think it was very well placed and very effective. Yeah, I agree. Um, so <laughs> with all sort of 
as we get preparing, you know, as Michelangelo gets to know Casey Marie a little bit, he introduces her to his her crew. And Michelangelo, she's like, she brings him back to the la the layer as it was, and in the ro certain rooms have been left untouched and all that. And she's she says to Michelangelo, she asks him, you know, train me, be my sensei. And he's like, at first he's like, absolutely not. Right. <clears throat> she keeps insisting. She, you know, she goes out on her own and gets herself in trouble. So he reluctantly is like, all right, you're fine. Um, and then there's one line where he's like, I'm trying to figure out who you who 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 you who you more like stubborn like your mom or your or your dad so i thought that was pretty funny <laughs> um and um but so he's i like the training scene um with them because you know she obviously has some skill and she says she has basically taught herself yeah. um but you hear you see you see mikey talking to his brothers and i think it's Raphael that says Imagine what she could be if she had 10 years of training. Yeah. Um, and during that very first kind of, I guess, training slash sparring session between the two of them, uh, you just see how much more advanced Michelangelo is than her because he's stopping her um, without yeah. breaking a sweat. And he's basically knowing every move she's going to make before she does it. And there's actually a big reveal, you know, during during these moments where where, you know, Mikey is talking with April. And there's a reveal that um, Casey Marie is in, in enhanced, if you will. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if I can you can call her 100 percent a mutant because obviously she's human. But she's sort of absorbed. She has traces of the mutagen ooze in her blood, right, in her DNA, because her parents had that. And the reason her parents had some of that in them is from the years of close contact with the turtles. So the turtles are basically radioactive. Yeah. Now, two things from my perspective. That's interesting because it's never really been played up like that before. And two... In the logic of this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles universe, kind of makes a lot of, uh, some sense. Again, in the in the context of this universe, it's an interesting choice to make. I'm not sure how I feel about it, to be honest with you, um, because. What does that mean for um, the rest of New York? I mean, I guess April and Casey were the people that they were around the most. Yeah, so they maybe were they were the, yeah. the only two people that were affected in such a way. Um, but I thought it was a neat way to actually connect Casey to the Turtles because even Michelangelo says in one um, in one panel, he says, we're family, the same mutagen runs through our blood. Yeah. Which is kind of nice for him because he doesn't have uh, any blood relatives left, right? So that, right. I think that's kind of a nice play. Um, we eventually get to the big third act, if you will, battle. Uh, what a you battle know, it is. Casey suits up at one point. You know, she's got her own domino mask and her own outfit. But eventually, she realizes that she has to get to her mother and make sure those people are safe and Mikey which you know he kind of wanted this all along fought this fight on his own and boy was it that was some brutal brutal stuff well the, the whole series is brutal I mean yeah. we see a lot of death a lot of blood a lot of people getting slashed with swords yeah um there's a scene uh, towards the end before the actual fight um, between Michelangelo and uh, Hiroto begins yeah. where uh, Michelangelo spins around with the sword and you just see like sick, sick, sick. And it, there's three headless beings behind him. That's yeah. something we're not accustomed to seeing in most Ninja Turtles properties. Right. Yeah. That's um, 
but the, you're right, and you're right to use the word brutal to describe the final battle because it stretches almost the length of the entire issue, which is 40 something pages. And it goes from rooftop to street level to sewer to uh, outskirts of town in the mud, from the penthouse down to the grimiest, uh, sludgiest, crappiest part of the city. And the art is so top notch that. When you see those bloody heads and the and the cuts, you almost feel them as a reader. It's like, oh, that you know that that hurts and, and what have you. Um, There's a real like uh, like a kinetic energy to it. That's that's a great way to phrase it. Now we we do get our first full look at full fledged you know Shredder 2.0, and his arm Shredder room. with a nanite costume. Yeah, it's very much. The way it would, like, he, he'd get stabbed and there'd be a dentation, but then it would he, would heal itself, it would yeah. repair itself. It reminded me of Terminator 2. Well, yeah, and, yeah, that, that even he says, um, when he first sees the suit, he says it's some kind of liquid metal, which the first thing yeah. you think of when he says that is T-1000. Yeah. But yeah. then when you're right, when it shows um, Michelangelo make the mark in, in his shoulder and there's like a, a, a large wound there, and then the next panel, it's, it's healed up into just like a small slit, it's gone. Yeah. And so that was pretty fascinating. And to sort of take Shredder 2.0 out, Michelangelo sacrifices himself at the same time. Right? Um, because well, he, he, he says this was always a one-way mission. Yeah, so... He was he was never planning on coming home from this. Yeah, so... Uh, and then it's it sort of, you know, the, the we get a shot of sort of like uh, Casey, Marie holding the, the lifeless body of Michelangelo, uh, kind of like Lois holding Superman type, type of deal. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, April's off behind them, kind of, you know, somberly you know, looking down. Uh, and then we get, a, we, we, we get a scene that mirrors uh, I think the beginning of book two. Right. Because he's dreaming. We got the, the monitors showing that he's got no heartbeat and whatever, but then he, like, he's got this, it's like this dreamscape kind of Visuals like it looks like an Instagram light filter or whatever. And right. He's back. He's back in the in the in the in the sewer in, in their hideout, and he's his brothers are there. Splinter is you know, basically they go rooftop leaping, and and New York is it's a sunny day, a bright sunny day. And they're commenting, you know, it's like the equivalent would be like New York, and it's like you know the. The, the most picturesque image of New York you can imagine. That's what we're kind of seeing as the turtles kind of traverse the, the rooftops. And they catch up with Splinter, and they're joking around with each other. You know, they're talking about uh, the last one to, you know, to reach such and such a location is the loser. Then they start making fun of uh, Raphael potentially farting and stuff like that. Uh, and the smell of that. And, and Splinter comes on the scene and makes a joke. It's very much like, and then, you know, they, they meet up, they, Casey joins them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very much like, it feels like those, the, the sort of turtles in heaven moment. Yeah. Kind of, kind of feels like the tone of the 87 cartoon. Like in a perfect world, this would be their perfect uh, scenario, right? Well, yeah, you could see this being a logical progression of the the characters on that show. Yeah, and then it, and then so I, I'm like, okay, it's over. And what I thought was the next few pages were probably going to be, you know, a cover gallery because there was like a thousand covers. So okay, the next few pages would be a cover, a cover gallery, but we get an epilogue, and it's present day, and April's working on something. Casey Marie comes in, and she says hello to her mother. She starts talking about what it was for breakfast, to which April says, I don't know, figure it out yourself, I'm busy. 
Uh, to which she's like, I wasn't talking to you. And she's like, hurt. And then she says, hurry up and grow. I've got a lot to teach you. And then we, we pan to, to an image that you see. In one of the panels, you see a, a TCRI canister with the ooze. And then you see this like scientific setup with the turtles, with four little turtles, and the ooze is being pumped into the you know, in, into their, their little containment area. So, and then it says it doesn't say the end. No, nope. it says to be continued. So, April and Casey Marie are creating for you. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I okay. I was a shocked by that. Yeah. And I'm like, I kind of really dig this because I wanted more from this universe. But with the turtles kind of dead in heaven, it's like, well, how are you going to do that? And now here's their here's the way. And here's what's interesting about it. It's a. It, it's now. It, it's 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 both. A role reversal and a complete uh, come back to the very be beginning because at the start of this, the turtle trained Casey, right? Right. Now we're going to have this, the spin around of that where April and Casey are the splinter to these four new turtles. Well, and they also have Splinter's book now. Yeah, so now they can. So really, they've created us in their own way, and this is beautiful on the part of IDW. Is they can have a turtle multiverse where you've got the IDW ongoing thing happening, and you've got this new mirage type universe where you can go whatever direction you want. So what do you think of that ending? Are you excited that we're that it looks like we're going to get more from this universe? Oh, I'll pick it up for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, especially if it has any of the same creative team coming back for it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know what the odds are, uh, are of getting the band back together for another series, but... Um, well, they've talked about wanting to do more, so... Yeah, I mean, 100%, I'm for it. And this was successful enough. That, I mean, this was sold out every time. So, um, you knew IDW wasn't just going to say, oh, well, that was nice. We got some good money out of it. Let's we'll just leave it there. Uh, yeah, no, uh, that's not gonna happen. So, and when I'm like, like it was definitively, it didn't say to be continued question mark. It said yeah to be continued dot dot dot. So now I'm like, all right, more. Where we're, we're now? Like wait, how is this not ready? Where's the next <laughs> issue? Um, do you think the makeup of the turtle turtles will be four brothers? Will we get two boy turtles and two girl turtles? Will we get like what? Are, what do you think would be the dynamic? Uh, interesting question. This would be a <clears throat> um, you know a good opportunity to shake some things up a little bit. Yeah. Maybe add a female in from the beginning or two. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hadn't really con considered that. I just assumed it was going to be four turtles that would grow up to be. You know, four male turtles because that that was what we've always had. But uh, yeah, I don't know. And are you going to rename them? She didn't after? put any like bows or anything mm -hmm. on their head, so we can't obviously tell and from looking what and, they are. And she didn't give them any names, so we don't know if it's going to be Leonardo, Donatello, or Michelangelo, and Raphael. It'll probably be. be I think the four will be homages to some of them. So, like one of them will be Mikey, probably just because. Michelangelo was such a big influence on her. Wouldn't surprise me if they name one after their dad, you know, Casey, right? Yeah. What you think one would be named Splinter? Just for posture. And then I don't know what the last one would be, but but yeah, I don't think it's gonna be a straight up, all right, we're gonna do the same four names again and off we go. And we're gonna yeah. retread. And what would be the point of doing that, right? Uh, right, you could just continue to tell the same stories with the same. If characters. you're if you're gonna do this, and it seems like they are, they're gonna want to take it in much like the Dark Knight Returns did. I, uh, first of all, learn mistakes from DK two. Don't do that. Whatever you do, 
don't do that. But they're going to want to take it in, you know, a new direction. So, like, have you ever read DK3, The Master Race, the third? Mm-mm. No, I haven't. Okay, that one was good. Ignore two if you haven't read it already. If you have, it is, what's done is done. But <laughs> the third one was good. Um, so I recommend that. But you, they're going to want to go in that direction. Or like, you know how Batman Beyond progresses the story. It's not just a retread of Bruce Wayne doing the same, uh, you know, stuff over and over again. So I don't think it's going to be a copy and paste job. It's definitely going to be different. Uh, uh, characters and dynamics here, so I'm I'm excited. Uh, uh, again, I love this overall. I, I think the story was was fantastic from from start to finish. Uh, the art was phenomenal. This is, I think, this book, this story, deserves to be mentioned in the same breath as. The Long Halloween, Kingdom Come, Dark Man Returns. Yeah. Like this, this is that good. Uh, I'm getting a, the. I, I told my coworker who downloaded the issue today. I told him I'm getting the the hardback hard edition yeah. of it as soon as it comes out. I made double dip. Yeah, 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 Cause got, yeah. Because I got the physicals and it's like yeah, yeah. Uh, I made double dip though. Um, but yeah, for me, in terms of a complete story from beginning to end. Uh, it's one of the best storyline stories I've read in comics, period, since I came back. And so for me, I'll just go ahead and give it away. It's a five for story and a five for art all the way through. Chris, final thoughts on great. Go ahead. Well, I hate to sound like I'm echoing your sentiments, but no, yeah, this is right. A- they're right. No, I'm kidding. No. Yeah, I mean, this is it's it's a ten for me, man. You know, it's it's a five and a five. It's yeah. it's top notch artistry in both from both the story to, so, storytelling perspective and from an artistic perspective. It's just so well done all around. Yeah, it's if you're a Turtles fan of any vintage, I mean, probably, look, if you're a five year old, yeah, maybe wait a few years. Uh, but if you dude. Been, I, how like imagine imagine an a hard PG thirteen or an R rated animated film of this? Like, wouldn't that just uh, be the uh, best? That would be great. But I got a better idea. You want to cap off the nineties movies in a big bad way? Here's how you do it. You use the, the original suits or the, or get somebody to remake it in that way, and it can be done because somebody made John Wesley Ships the Flash costume in twenty twenty, and it looked friggin' damn good. So don't tell me it can't be done. Do that. You you take the continuity of the of the first the first four if you want to ignore or the first three I should say if you want to ignore three it was there was three right yeah okay if you want to ignore three go go for it uh, you know but take the continuity of those films fill in the gaps like these flashbacks do and give us a proper um, sequel to those original I think the fans of those movies will go nuts. Can you imagine? Come on. A bunch of 40-year-olds in a theater watching yeah. live-action Last Ronin? Yeah. Yeah, that would be pretty serious. That's funny, man. I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd be there on opening night. No yeah, question. No, I'll be there. Look, if they did this animated, I'd take it. But when I just when you're thinking about like uh, legacy sequels and nostalgia, and then I think of, man... Look at how awesome Logan was. This is Logan for the turtles, damn it. You'd be printing money by Paramount or Nickelodeon, whoever, Viacom, whoever the hell owns this thing. Make the movie. Come on. You can still do the reboot. I'll still watch it. I'll watch it all. I don't care. I mean... Really, you could almost do a limited series with it. It wouldn't have to be a movie yeah. because of all the Paramount flashbacks and stuff. Yeah, with all the flashbacks, I mean, yeah. you could have each episode be half set in the past and half set in the in the in the yeah. present. Yeah. Oh, I want that now. Come on, somebody who's yeah. in charge? Get on that. Uh, 
I, but yeah, a hard, it, it's got to be a hard, you know, an adult translation yeah, of it. You yeah. can't, you can't uh, kiddify it. Yeah, but that's the beauty. See, and this is the beauty of it is you have Rise of the TMNT on Netflix. They're doing a movie, right? You have the, the new animated is, is 3D, CGI, whatever it is. Seth Rogen is doing animated, right? right? You have, I think the, 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 the Joe's brothers are writing a new live action movie. So you have that, whatever that's going to be. And then you have this on Paramount Plus as the more adult thing for us who were there back in 1990 and 1987, you know, their PGAs and all the whole nine yards. I, I do it. I, I don't see why, I don't understand why not. Like, it, with the nostalgia and craze that's going on now, to me, it's easy money. Like, they gave me, well, because of delays, they're giving me Michael Keaton back. Now I want this. <laughs> Come on, complete, complete the, complete the set. Give me, give me, give me both and I'll be happy. And then I just yeah. need the hockey team to win a playoff for a round and I'd be even more excited, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but yeah, no, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm on board. This is ripe for um, translation in other media. It, it, it just, yeah. you're, 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 you're wasting valuable IP if you don't do anything with it outside of the comic realm. Um, again, especially because we're in the midst of a nostalgic raise. We're, we're getting indie, what is it, indie five? Yeah. I think. The sixth Jurassic Park movie. Top Gun is coming back after four, what seems like forty-five years. Hasn't been. That yeah, long. we saw that. We saw that preview um, before Doctor Strange, and my son was like, "Ooh, I want to see that." And I was like, "Yeah." Now come yeah. on, so you're telling me that's not going to do well. Top Gun Maverick. Of course it is. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, dude. So that's what I'm saying. If the nostalgia thing is there, how does? How does Paramount and Viacom not look at that and say, man, these 40-year-olds still love this 90s thing. We can't seem to... We, we've tried rebooting it with, with, the, with, the, with the Michael Bay Turtles. It, the first one was solid. They were okay. It didn't quite work the way they want. Okay. How do we hook these guys? This, this particular set. That's how you do it with what me and Chris are suggesting here. So there's free ideas, Paramount. You have to pay us. Uh, maybe a trip to the premiere. We'll talk, but whatever. Uh, anyway, um, do it. Do something with it. That's that's my thing. But overall, fantastic comic book storytelling. Comic book storytelling at its finest. Looks like there's going to be more, and I'm here for it. And just go ahead and take my money when it's released. But that's all we have for the last one uh, for now. Uh, we'll be back with more turtle stuff. Uh, we've got a couple more movies to do. We've got a lot of animation to do, so there'll be plenty of turtles talk from us in the weeks and months ahead, so stay tuned. But until uh, until our next episode, if you want to talk to us about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you can on social media. Chris, where do they track you down? You can find me on Twitter at Chris N. Harrelson, or just search for Commodore Schmidlap. Yeah. Um, Adam will be posting this episode in the Facebook group. Um, so if you want to join in any chatter there, just comment on the Facebook post, post your own post on the on there, and uh, you find us there. Yeah, and we'd love to start getting questions. So I, I know I keep forgetting to do the actual post, but we'd like to actually start getting questions. So if you have questions, leave them in the in the in the you know on Twitter when you see it but when you see me post this leave a question you know with some TMNT hashtag or whatever uh, and and we'll answer your questions as if they if and as they come in but if you want to chat with me it's at Adam underscore Leafs fan on Twitter uh, we have the Twitter page for the podcast Vidcast Network at MMN PDC, the Facebook uh, group, which Chris mentioned, there is a link that can be found in the description below. Click that, and we will. Uh, I will add you. We can continue the conversation there. But until next time, remember that the last Roman is forever, from the first issue to the last. 
So long, everybody.